Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Tori Chrisman was a member of Scientology for 30 years. She joined at age 22 and escaped out at almost age 53. Tori was briefly a member of Scientology's Sea Org, or Sea Organization, being kicked out when she asked to refill her medication for epilepsy. After moving to Florida with her family, she was a volunteer for 20 years for OSA, the Office of Special Affairs, sometimes known as the secret CIA of Scientology, and also sometimes known as the Office of Dirty Tricks. She started the Bridge to Total Freedom in 1969 and quit in the year 2000, realizing it was a con. When she escaped out, she began speaking out. After Scientology kept harassing her, she developed her own YouTube site, and she now has 17,000 subscribers with over 4 million views. Tori stresses that people should do their research and always make up their own minds. Let's go talk to her now. You are a strong person, and I think that not only are you strong, but you're also fun to hang out with. You but too. I <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, but I think what also is is kind of amazing is that sometimes when you're pushed in the ways that you've been pushed, you find out what you're made of. Right. And so now you have made how many videos about your experiences in Scientology? I've now made over 800. Oh. I have 4 million subscribers. I've, <laughs> no, I have 17,000 subscribers. Okay. I have 4 million hits on my YouTube site. And most of them are out of my bedroom. You know, it's kind of funny. It's just, I, I wasn't going to do them. And in, in, in 2008, Anonymous showed up. And Mark Bunker came over and he said, this is, a, this is a gift from Anonymous. It was a webcam. And I said... What am I going to talk about? And he said, well, let's make a video saying Tori Magoo has a YouTube site. Uh-huh. <laughs> it just, I mean, Anonymous was so great. And they, for me, they totally changed the history of Scientology. Now, I want to make something clear. It isn't that they alone did, because many, many people before them mm-hmm. helped bring up the awareness mm-hmm. of, and, you know, fighting the church and exposing the church. But they, as a massive group, you know, we did a picket of 9,000 people in one day mm-hmm. around the world in every major city. It was really awesome. Because they got the word out or how? Yeah, they, well, what happened was um, Scientology, somebody leaked a video of Tom Cruise saying you're either in or out. Right. You look really crazy. Uh. And naturally, Scientology being the morons that they are, said they get it off YouTube uh-huh. or we're coming after you. Uh-huh. And anonymous being all these anonymous people around the world went, really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh-huh. And they said, uh, this is anonymous and we're going to take down your website for three days to show you who owns the internet. Right? Yes. And I was against hacking at the time. And so I said, oh, this is just OSA. It's not really anybody. I didn't know Anonymous. So they mm-hmm. called me that night in my bedroom that this is Anonymous. And I was like, ah, ah. <laughs> totally freaked me out. But they were very cool. They didn't exactly have the greatest plans. And I really educated them quickly on how legal the Church of Scientology is. And I said, they will put you in jail for anything, anything that they can push on you or say that you yeah, did. very litigious. <clears throat> it has to yes. be totally legal. So mm-hmm. they said, well, what can we do? And I said, let's do a picket. So that, and Mark Bunker was, you know, sit, doing the wise beard man thing saying, you guys can do what you want, but we're gonna, the ones that are going to end up getting in trouble. Mm-hmm. So the two of us together kind of got that going. And then a whole bunch of people joined in and it was just so fun to have people say their names yeah, but the first one was blown for good, which is Mark Henry. Yeah, yeah. And he walked up to me and he said, I'm blown for good. I'm Mark Headley. And uh, I was like, oh. That's great. <laughs> it really made me it's happy. a great book. People should great book. read it. Great, great What book. is amazing about the book Blown for Good, I think, is in the amount of detail, it, it shows you just sort of a day in the life. Right. Right, just the pressure, it, sort of what you have to do, and who's going to be right around the corner to yell at you about this and yell at you about that. And my heart was racing as I was reading not only about the escape, but just really day to day what day-to-day. it's like to be in that kind of and environment. And that's for the Sea Org, just yeah. so that I make that clear, because a lot of people think that equals everyone, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it's a very select group of people that mm-hmm. sign a billion-year contract. They're there twenty-four-seven. For their life, that's what they think. Right. So that, but the thing I also loved about Blown for Good, that book, and Mark, is that it's funny. 
Yeah. You know, he keeps a humor in it, which which really helps. People have mentioned that to me as far as my videos too, because it it's such a dark subject. If you just keep it all black, people, it's just like they just plug out. And I think also it shows a certain amount of bravery, being able to, and, and distance, right? If you have the distance from it, and you can laugh about it because so much of it is just so over the top and right. ridiculous. Right. But when you're in it, you don't have that kind of perception and distance from it yeah. and too afraid to, yeah, to yeah. say what's true. Um, also, if you use certain expressions or acronyms or all that, I'll, I'll probably stop and explain. Right. So you were saying sure. OSA. I know you said originally it's Office of Special Affairs. Can you tell people about what the Office of Special Affairs does? Okay, originally it was called the Guardian's Office. Mm -hmm. When I got in, I got in in 1969, and they had the Guardian's Office, and nobody knew what they were doing. It was all top secret. And whatever, I, I you know, it was a bunch of creepy things. They ended up having, I think, the biggest break-in in the history of the, the federal government. They were breaking into the federal government. That was one of the things. And that just blew up. They, they had a raid at, at now Celebrity Center. It used to be the Manor Hotel. And they raided. I lived there. and they had to, But I just moved out. And they raided there. And they found all these programs. One on Paulette Cooper, who had just gone into Scientology. She's a journalist and a wonderful person. Mm -hmm. And she thought, well, I'll, I'll check out Scientology. She goes in there, writes a little paperback book about the scandal of Scientology. And it just, they went nuts. They had, they tried to sue her, I think, seven, a ton of times and mm -hmm. tried to put her in prison. And she was, it was called Operation Freakout. Ugh. And and it was, it was close, but they mm -hmm. had this big raid and they found Operation Freakout, which she'd been saying, look, they're doing this stuff to me and no one would believe her. You know, back then it was so tricky. That's one of the things I really want to emphasize is that people in this day and age have such a luxury of exposure mm -hmm. you know and it's yeah. really important like it it just when i see people attacking people you know journalists like tony ortega mm -hmm. you know you weren't there when we would have given anything for one article for one tv show for anything for somebody to help expose and back up what we were saying right. but the media would not touch it until anonymous no. showed up no. they just would not touch it. They would do interviews with me. They would call me. I would do an hour-long interview. It would be three-fourths Tom Cruise and two seconds of me mm -hmm. looking the worst that I looked in an hour. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Always. <laughs> and it pissed me off. I wrote Oprah. I wrote everyone. Nobody would touch it. Mm -hmm. So now we have the luxury of different people, yourself included, doing these podcasts and interviews. And then slowly you see people starting to get picked apart. OSA's thing, I worked for their top secret mafia, and they had three goals for the internet. And I didn't know they, you know, I knew nothing about what their real purpose was because it was just my best friend and auditor who said, we need some help on the internet. Could you help us? And I said, yeah, sure. So he said, this was in the 90s, and he said, um, we just need you to open an account. Just one account, walk in. They don't open accounts anymore. They, I mean, they won't at all mm -hmm. if you walk in. You have to do it on the Internet. And this was way new to the Internet for everybody. Right. So other people that have been on the Internet forever are, like, are born on the Internet are like, huh? Mm -hmm. But this was before the Internet really got going or just got going. And so anyway, I got in, I wanted an email and a password. I got it, brought it back to him. He had a grin from ear to ear. I said, what? He said, you just changed the history of the internet. That's all I'm going to say. And I said, how can I change the history of the internet when I don't even know what it is? <laughs> right. <laughs> but point being, they paid me to fly around the United States and open up these phony accounts. I kept saying, what are we doing with this? And they'd say, we're not going to tell you because... You know me. This was my best friend and auditor. You trust me. I would never do anything illegal. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. And he said, and if you, if I tell you, you're, they're going to put you in deposition, and they'll keep you in deposition, and you don't want that. Which is really what the Church of Scientology does. Mm -hmm. So it just, it's like mind control. And I went, yeah, you're right. I don't. Okay, don't tell me. I trust you. It's fine. So I'm opening these accounts. I'm too afraid to read the internet, which I know, again, sounds crazy to people that were born on the internet, mm -hmm. but back in the dark ages, you know, of like the 90s, people, they, you know, one of my friends went crazy. She went insane. And Bill Yachty, the guy that got me to do this, said, Tori, she only went insane because she was reading the internet.
Now, again, I know people that are born on the internet or even people later are laughing, going, how could that be? But back then, it was like, really? And you have to get, that's why I call it the Scientology Truman Show. Because it's like when you're in, if, and if you haven't seen that movie, The Truman Show, watch it. Because that is Scientology. And you cannot see the walls. And if you start to see the walls, they cut off the people you're talking to. Yeah. Or get you to cut yeah. off from them. Right. Or your family, anything. And I think also one of the best ways to keep people from information is to make them afraid of it. So right. something bad is going to happen to you. Right. Something bad is going to happen to you if you're also in connection with someone who's an SP, a suppressive person. Right. What is going to happen to you or what is already happening to you because you have an association with someone they call an SP? What's the threat? I'm going to answer that. But first, I want to finish your first question, yeah, which yeah. is what is the Office of Special Affairs? Yeah. Oh, sure. So once the Guardian's office happened and they sent 11 people to prison including mary sue hubbard yeah. l ron hubbard said i would Wife. never yeah. do that even though we have people that are now out that say he wrote the program of course he of course but he, was in he sent his wife to prison and she was never seen again that was it i mean she was only there for a year but then they kept bodyguards on her i'd see her at the amc or something she'd say hi but that was it that's all mm -hmm. she could say mm -hmm. so they morphed into the Office of Special Affairs. They made an announcement saying that L. Ron Hubbard would never do these kind of things that these awful people have done. And so now the Guardian's office is canceled and the Office of Special Affairs is created. And it's just PR and legal. That's all it is. And we're just helping grow mm -hmm. our church, right? And it's sort of like, okay. And again, you're in the Truman Show. It sounds good. It looks good. It seems right. You know, mm -hmm. why, would, why would they do anything bad? You know? I know people listening to this now, there's so much information out there from so many different people. It's hard to imagine that just a short time ago, people, you know, in the 90s, and even people that are in Scientology still, they don't know. They, right. they, they can't see the walls. They really don't. They see the blue sky, like in the Truman Show. Yeah. They, they can't see it. They can't see it. It's very true. And some of them, even if they do see it, they don't want to leave. And that brings my answer to your question mm. of suppressive people. Mm -hmm. They're in there and they know if they leave and speak out at all, sometimes even if they leave, they're going to be declared a suppressive person, which L. Ron Hubbard said was the most evil person on the planet, which I am. And they compared me to <laughs> Hitler in a meeting with all these ministers. <laughs> it was really funny. Oh, wow. Let's see. Hit There's only a few SPs. Hitler was an SP and Tory's an SP. Oh. And I, I just wish I had one photograph of the ministers. It was like probably 30, 40 ministers. And they're all looking at me going, Tory? <laughs> <laughs> it was the end of the meeting. The, and this guy that had walked in hated me. He was like a lead opinion leader minister here in L.A. And he just gave me this filthy look. And you could tell they had been telling him shit about me all week. Right. And I said, all right, let's see how it goes, man. And by the end, they lost. Totally. Wow. Epic fail. Okay. Epic fail. <laughs> so okay. when so point being to answer your question, you declared yeah. suppressive. Nobody can talk to you. I lost all my friends overnight, thirty year friends, quote unquote, and my husband of twenty seven years. That's it. But you have the and people go, Well, why didn't you stay? Well, you really have a choice of staying with criminals at this point. At that point I'd realized these guys they had turned on me and it was like a spiritual rape for hours after tricking me for ten years. You know, saying I'm helping them, and I realized they're really creepy people. They're not doing what they say. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like stay with them or take your freedom back. And I just went, you know what? I'm taking my freedom back. That's oh, it. what an what an incredible time, though—a frightening time and a lonely time. And so it's so important for people who are leaving any of these groups to be able to connect with other people. And right, and it's actually a necessity. It is. And I always remind people of Andreas. I mean, I just get chills all the way up and down my body just saying it. I mean, I was in my house all alone. I couldn't talk to anyone. And, and these people had been making me use phony names, phony addresses, phony everything. These are Scientologists You're doing this whole tricky thing, trying to get these open accounts on the Internet so that they could basically spam the Internet and and drive people away or make mm. you think less of you or stuff like that, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that, but once I, w once I started waking up, I was like, I didn't get into Scientology to do this. I, it was on ARS, Alt Religion Scientology, which was a, just a news group. It was linear, like from top to bottom. 
And that's all you could post was like, L. Ron Hubbard's a liar. Their goal was to get that flushed all the way down the page and onto the second page. Mm -hmm. Because their view was nobody reads the second page. And they're not that wrong on that. Mm -hmm. Most people read the top stuff kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they would post all kinds of junk just to distract off of L. Ron Hubbard's a liar. Mm -hmm. That was their goal. Or, or David Miscavige beats people. They don't want anybody to see that. So they would just slime all of alt-religion Scientology with anti-psych stuff. Right. The day that I finally looked, I realized they started acting mafia-like, and I grew up in Chicago around the mafia, and I thought, <laughs> wait a minute, something's wrong here. And I, I thought, i got to go look. And I looked on ARS. I hadn't, I hadn't read it at all, which is a thing people get mixed up because there's interviews about me on the Internet where they say I had been posting anti-Scientology stuff, and I wasn't. That's uh -huh. not true. Not okay. for them, ever. Right. I never did. I never. I was afraid to look at it until right now. And I went and looked at it in June of 2000. And luckily that day, there was a whole page of baking recipes. Uh -huh. And in between it were people saying, I didn't say that. Scientology changed my words. And uh -huh. I just freaked out. I thought, oh, my God, they're, they're stopping free speech with my accounts that I'm opening up. Oh, and then wow. I got really scared. And I thought, this isn't just Bill Yachty and Osa. This is Miscavige. I just mm. knew it. And I, and I thought, they're going to come after me. Mm -hmm. So I, I called up Bill and I said, hey, Bill, you know, it's Tori. I just wanted to let you know, I can't do this anymore. I've got to get back to my job. I need to make some more money, blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, okay, no problem. Just meet us at this apartment in Glendale. And I said, oh, okay. So I go over to this apartment, and it's all men. They're all big men. They're all OT7s or 8s. O OT7 is their top stuff. It's operating Thetan. A Thetan is like a spirit. So they, they call each other OTs, operating Thetan. They've been friends of mine for years, and usually big hug, hi, Tori. I walk in, and they're like, hello, hello, hello. The, the lights are really dim. And I'm thinking, okay, something feels very weird here. Very weird. And Bill is not there. And all of a sudden, oh. and this guy Gavino ran the whole program. There was only about five or ten of us in this whole program. So all of a sudden, bam, the door slams open. Gavino comes walking in with Bill, and he starts screaming at Bill, I warned you about her. I warned you about her. And I look at Bill, my best friend and auditor, and say, he warned you about what? What exactly didn't you tell me? And it was a two-hour, I called a spiritual rape. They just kept yelling at me and screaming at me. What are you going to say? Who are you going to tell it to? All this shit. And I, I just finally snapped. I mean, I'm a person who can take a lot of stuff, but once, I, once it yeah. fills up, yeah. that's it. And you, don't, you have no idea what I'm going to do, but it's usually pretty good. <laughs> and I, I, went, I started crying. I ran out. Bill came running after me. I knew that second. He knew he screwed up. Uh, he knew it. Okay. And I walked out. I got in my car. He was running after me. I said, get away from me. Get away from me. Right. Don't touch me. Get away from me. And I jumped in my car, started it, drove home. Now you have to get my husband knew nothing about any of this. Oh, wow. So now I'm home with my husband who's like, what's going on? I said, I can't talk about it. Just, mm -hmm. it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And it took me another couple of years before I finally woke up, really. I kept thinking... You know, I stopped working with them. It was just like I was done. But it took a little while for me to fully wake up. I'm not, I get mixed up on the time on that. It could have been closer to 2000. They mistreated you and were highly abusive. Highly. I mean, it was really creepy. Yeah. I, if, you, if I could have had a video of it, you would not believe the stuff they, the stuff I lived through with Scientology is unbelievable. When I left, Robert Von Young used to write for Freedom Magazine. He's a great author. Mm -hmm. And Freedom ever, Magazine is Scientology's, Scientology's magazine. magazine. Yeah, and he, ironically titled Freedom. And you can Google him because he, he has great, he's really a good writer. But he called me every day and he said, look, someone leaving Scientology is like an abused woman. They're real nice to you and then you feel like you have to go back. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I said, listen to me carefully. Me going back to Scientology is the same as telling a Jew they're going to go back to the concentration camps. Mm. That's how strongly I feel. Right. Because I have epilepsy, and they made me get off my medicine, and I had grand mal seizures. I still have a crappy short-term memory because of that for the rest of my life. Their abuse of me and my body because of that condition, calling me a degraded being, and your PTS, which is potential trouble source, which is, again, another horrible person. You know, it's just sort of like people would go, well, why did she stay? But remember the Truman Show. 
Mm-hmm. That's it. You're in the mm-hmm. show. And there's enough people that are nice to you. For 30 years, people would pull me in a room and say, are you still on that medication? I mean, that's against the law now to do yeah. something like that. Right. That, that's what they would say. You well, it's negligence. It's medical, physical neglect. It's a totally. lot of things. It's malpractice. And so, okay, you were having seizures. In the and, 70s. In the 70s. And they would not let you go. I was in the Sea Org. I, okay. I joined the Sea Org. And then I ran out of my medicine. And so I said, look, I'm out of my medicine. I got I to gotta order some medicine. So they sent me to the MLO, the medical liaison officer, which was some 18-year-old bozo and if you're out there, <laughs> uh-huh. never mind. Uh-huh. Anyway, yeah. um, they sent me to this dot, guy dot, and dot. he said, oh, we're going to get you off your medicine. Dianetics is going to fix this. You're going to take vitamins and, me- and Dianetics and that's it. And I said, oh, okay. I mean, I was 23 or something. I was like a young kid. And I thought, all right, that sounds good. And I start trying to get off my medicine and take these vitamins. And I'm starting to have these seizures and my mother, who I wasn't, I was very close to her as a little girl, but then in my teens, because I got so crazy, we weren't really best friends, but she stayed on me. She, and I say this to every parent, I say this because it's important. It doesn't matter if you're close to your children or not. If they're in a cult, do something. Mm. Don't just think, oh, I want to wait until they get out. No, they're going to die in there. I would have been dead. Another epileptic is dead because they got him off of all of his medicine. He's dead. But she just stayed on it. She called me every day. And one night she said, what are you doing tonight? And I said, I'm going on a date. And she said, okay, I'll call you tomorrow. I said, okay. She called me the next day. She said, how was your day? I said, what day? Uh, She said, okay, that's it. Either your doctor calls me today and you're on your medication today. And your doctor says you're on your medication today. Or I'm going to personally fly out there from Chicago to LA and trust me on this story L. Ron Hubbard and the Church of Scientology will never forget your mom. And I knew she would not just come handle them. She would be on the media telling everyone, don't let your kids get in Scientology, which would have been great. But Mm -hmm. back then I was in the show and I didn't didn't want that to happen. And who wants to have seizures anyway? So now I had an excuse, which was I have to or my mom's going to come kill you guys. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. So I haven't had seizures since seventy. Thank goodness. Yeah. Thank goodness. So it's true about rescuing your loved ones. So many people I talk to say that they were sometimes just really praying that someone would come and rescue them, that someone would ignore the happy right. look on their face and the right. calm demeanor and be able to see right through it and come get them anyway because yeah. they weren't at liberty to say how much they were really suffering and how much they really couldn't act on their own behalf anymore. And so it is a very important thing, a very important message for families and friends. With that, I will say it's a very tricky road. And, and it's like the best thing to use is love. It really mm-hmm. is. Because mm-hmm. you try to slam in Xenu or all these crazy things from these cults, and, and you people, myself included, they would send me out to handle the critics. And they were all yelling facts at me. I felt like it was like plexiglass. It came down, and it would just bounce off. I never heard a word of what they said. But one guy came up to me. He was never in Scientology. Brian, I will always thank him. This is way before Andreas, way before I woke up. And I was out at Celebrity Center trying to handle these critics. And they're all yelling, I'm not hearing a thing. Mm -hmm. And this guy, Brian, comes over to me and he says, can I ask you a question? And he actually, I could tell he wanted an answer. He wasn't like trying to just put me down. He was genuine. He really wanted to know. Yeah. And I said, yeah, sure. And he said, how could you say you're free if you can't read certain books? Mm. And I said, oh, I can read any books I want. I just don't want to. But... Again, just like Andreas. Andreas didn't leave me alone. He stayed on it. He offered me a hand out of this nightmare, Mm -hmm. and then he stayed on it. When people were saying to him in 2000, don't talk to her, she's Osa, and all this other stuff, Andreas said, look, I'm in Norway. I'm just using words. That's all. I'm just asking her questions. Mm -hmm. I'm fine. And he Mm -hmm. stuck with me. If he hadn't, I don't know what I would. I I may have gone back to Scientology. I don't know. So being asked that question, how did you say you're free? He asked it over and over. See, he asked it like Uh, over and over. I'd say, "I I can read anything. And he'd say, okay, but let me ask you again and think about it. How free could you be if somebody can tell you what books to read and not read? You just kept burying the question, asking it. But it was with such kindness and love, again, Mm -hmm. that it it just went into my heart. It's like music. Music can go through walls. It can go under doors. And it can get to your heart. Mm -hmm. Music helped me wake up. It was a big part of my waking up was also music. Because certain songs can get to you that Mm -hmm. people can't say to you. 
And yeah. for me, it was um, the Counting Crows. It started with Dolly Parton, <laughs> Joy to the World. Wow. At Christmas time, I must have listened to it a thousand times. Uh-huh. And I remember, I got back to when I was a little kid. It clicked me out of my, my whole cult thing mm-hmm. into when I was a little kid and I was on stage. And I was like just a little angel on stage, part of a, a theater. But it got me to boom out of that for a second and remember my life separate from this group. You know, when you talk about things like music, I think about the, the kind of multi-sensory approach to intervening on someone's behalf when they're stuck in something. And sometimes it's playing a song or hearing a right. song. Sometimes when parents want to know what they can say, that would be the thing that would help their child think. It might not be what they say. It could be that they remember their child likes a certain kind of cookie from the holidays exactly. and they bake them that cookie and smelling it and tasting it reminds them that their childhood was actually okay or that these yeah. are people who they love, and these are experiences they're missing out on. And this is also joy that they're feeling that's very primal that they have not felt since. Right. Because I know people within cultic groups become pretty humorless, very serious. Everything's very serious. And so being able to go back to listening to those songs and having the endorphin release and just, you know, just feeling good. Yeah. I'm sure it's something that, you know, you hadn't felt for a while. Well, I, I I never was really serious. My husband and I, he was he's really goofy. <laughs> and he's on the internet, you can see him <laughs> with us trying to handle the critics, but Oh, interesting. He being really goofy, but so we had a lot of humor in our life in Scientology, but oh, we weren't good. in the Sea Org, you know, they kicked uh, me out oh. basically cuz I had to get off my medicine and oh, I right. couldn't. Yeah. And so I finally thought, "All right, forget it." But that's why I did a lot of things with the executives because I wanted, I always used to say I'm on the bridge next to the bridge to total freedom. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Because people would say, how can you do this? You're on medication and Hubbard's against medication, which later I found out after I got out, he was popping pills all the time. The other thing about the internet is being able to get confirmation. And I remember them saying there was no such thing as an SP declare. And I had them. I mean, I had people, clients of mine would bring them in and say, this is what I just got. So I had them in my files in my office. And then that you would read that they don't exist. I'm holding one in my hand. And so there's something so trippy about that, about your reality really being played with. And and so maybe this is a false document. You just don't know who to believe and who to trust. But yes, going back to the internet and the media, I remember for many years, I was not allowed to say that Scientology was a cult. I couldn't even really say the word. Right. And just being able to say Scientology <laughs> out loud and Scientology is a cult, it's incredibly freeing. And I wasn't in it, right. but I just have the fear that was put in me through, from their PIs and other sure. harassment and sure. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So the freedom now that you have outside of it, you know, that's not the bridge to total freedom. It's the bridge away from your freedom. Exactly. And it's amazing. And if there's any Scientologists listening, which they do, I, I want to tell you that they build into your part of the Truman Show, the Scientology Truman Show, is that there's nothing for you outside. That everything, your whole internal freedom for eternity is in Scientology, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And these people outside are either pre-Scientologists that are going to get in, mm-hmm. or they are what they call wogs, which Hubbard said was a wise old gentleman, which I found out when I got out, it's actually a racist term and really creepy, which I never liked anyway. I used to say, I don't like calling them wogs. So then this one guy said, okay, we'll call them pre-Scientologists. Okay. So that means anybody who isn't in mm-hmm. is a pre-Scientologist, or they're degraded beings, or just creepy people, you know, but there's nothing good out there for you. And I just want to tell any Scientologist listening, that is so utterly false. It's unbelievable. I mean, the help that I got, I honestly, I, I it makes me cry to this day. And I've been out for 18 years, but so many people came to my rescue and helped me. Mm. You're so brainwashed that there's nothing. Yeah. And then you get out and there's like thousands of people that are just wonderful people. And it's, it's really a shock. It really is. I'm and sorry, I'm, no, I'm no, it's actually <laughs> but really you know beautiful. What? I mean, I've been out 18 years, but I still, go, I remember it so yeah, well. Yeah, And people that were like... You're being handed a tissue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> or you. close and, to it. And, <laughs> you know, yeah. people that took me in, you know, like a couple of my friends let me stay at their house because my husband was trying to kick me out of the house. Mm-hmm. And after, you know, I went to Clearwater for a month, and then when I came back, he was like, well, you're out of here. And I... I really thought he was going to come with me. I didn't know they did the dirty tricks that they did until Mm -hmm. I decided to leave. 
and I said, what do I do? And Bob Minton said, just go to the airport. We'll have a ticket there for you. And I said, okay. So I called a van. I ordered a van to get there. And now it's Wednesday morning or something, and there's no van. And oh. um, so I called the van company, and I go, what's going on? And they go, oh, somebody anonymously called and canceled the van. Now, I'm wearing a black shirt. Imagine like a pinhole of light coming through this black shirt. That was like the first time I realized all these years what yeah. critics had told me, because I would be sent out to handle these critics since 1979. Ugh. So people had been telling me these truths about Scientology, but they said it in such a mean way, I'd think, ah, bullshit. And of course, Ois is right there saying, oh, come on, you don't believe those people, do you? And I was like, no, nah, don't worry about it. You know, they're mm -hmm. just yelling and they're, they're believing some stuff on the internet, you know, that kind of thing. That's they're why guilty I say, of crimes. Or... That's why I say mm -hmm. use love and mm -hmm. kindness because mm -hmm. they're not used to that. See, they're, they're drilled and built on hatred, anger, bull baiting, which is where, you know, you sit and people can yell shit at you and you have to take it until you can take it without any reaction at all. Right, that is part of the training. What's that called? It's the... on the first course, the communication course. They're called TRs, training routines, right. and it's called bull baiting. Mm. You Incredible. know, you have to first learn to confront someone. Mm -hmm. We did for two hours. You had to do it. Then they bull bait you where they start yelling sh stuff at you and, and you know, break you down. And then you have to be able to confront it. And so after a while, you know, they're used to this kind of stuff. So that's why I see the people that think they're, they're getting to them when they're yelling. It's like, no, you're not getting to them. Mm -hmm. they, they walk in and go, don't you see what, these, what morons these guys are? Mm -hmm. And you go, yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. But when someone's kind and loving, that's a different thing. Right. It's like, I don't know. They, people say it to me all the time, you're so nice. And it's like, well, <laughs> I are. am a naturally nice person, you know, in, yeah. in general. I'm not, I'm not all the time nice, but I, my mother <laughs> raised me. It's like, look, you got two choices in a day. And they had a lot of money. They had a lot of stuff. Very successful people. But she said, this isn't it. Our house isn't it. Your dad being a celebrity isn't it. Our cars aren't it. She said, what's, and I said, all right, well, what's it? And this is when I was a little kid. She said, every day, get up and you find something that's gorgeous about today. You find the beauty oh. in life. Oh, and, and that's fantastic. And put your attention on that, Tori. That's what matters. And it, 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 and it you know, like Spanky always says, you, you have the happy gene. And I said, I do. But, you know, it's a, part, a lot of it is how my mom raised right. me. Spanky, Spanky Taylor, good yes. friend, good friend it, of yours. She's in Going yeah. Clear, if you haven't seen that. That's a good one to yeah, see. Yeah, she's awesome. So I think a couple things about what you've been saying. Not only were you enveloped by love and care and friendships, but they were unconditional friendships outside of the group. Right. And that's something that's really alarming for people who leave a cultic group where they had already said goodbye to friends and family in order to have these relationships only come to find that they were completely conditional, then you have this amazing sense of loss and an empty place inside. That's why it's so important to have that space filled with people who can accept you for who you are, not just because you believe the same way. Right. And now I've had a really neat thing where other people in other cults have started watching my videos. Oh, that's cool. And the first one was Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm. And they wrote me and they said, we can't thank you enough. We're ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. And I said, what happened? And they said, well, we were sitting around watching your videos and laughing at Scientologists and what idiots they are. And then we realized, wait a minute, we're doing the same thing. <laughs> And this happened two months wow. ago. I was at a gift show, and I felt this little tapping on my shoulder, and I said, hello? And she said, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting her. I said, no, it's okay. And she said, I, I'm part of your YouTube side. I just wanted to thank you. And I said, I gave her a hug, and I said, what, what happened? And she said, well, my children were in the Jehovah's Witness, uh -huh. and they started watching your videos, and now they're out, and they're free. So oh, I my just goodness. wanted to thank you. And so I was like... Ah, that, that's really cool that's where you're getting really to other cool. people in other cults. That's so fantastic. And it shows how similar they are. Right. And, and it also shows you that th your cult leader didn't invent this. No. Not I at mean, all. maybe some of the terminology, maybe some of the, some of the techniques, but really, I mean, I have yeah. this in the support group that I run where they say, oh, yeah, me too, or oh, yeah, us too. Right. And almost the exact same kind of manipulative tactics, like cult leaders and narcissistic partners have all read the same manual. Right, right. Yeah, it really is an incredible thing. So to come back to your story, so your van was canceled. 
What did you do? So my van's canceled. I don't even know I'm escaping at this point. I just think, okay, some weirdo canceled my van. But then I realize it's probably Osa, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I start calling other vans, and every van is booked on mm -hmm. that day. And I thought, mm -hmm. come on, on a Wednesday morning, it just seemed too weird. Anyway, I finally, I thought, I don't care what happens, I'm getting to the airport. So I get to the airport, the plane's canceled. I helped train John Travolta, and I think, can Travolta cancel like a plane? I, I didn't know. I still don't know to this day whether that was just an accident or wh whether they had something right. to do with it. Okay. But the plane was canceled. Stacy had said to me beforehand, bring a phone. Now, everybody on this listening to it owns a phone, and most of you are probably on your phone right now. <laughs> but back then, we didn't. It was 2000, and they were promoting have an emergency phone. In case there's an emergency, you have a mm -hmm. phone. And so Stacy Brooks was high up in the church and had left. And she said, Tori, bring a phone. And I said, oh, come on, Stacy. They don't do stuff like that. And she said, Tori, I used to run these programs. I know what I'm talking about. And so does Jesse, Jesse Prince. And she said, bring a phone. So I bring this little flip phone I had that was, or I don't even know what it was, some mm -hmm. little portable phone. And I walk into the airport at LAX and up comes the vice president of OSA. And she said the vice president of Scientology, Janet Wyland, I think was her name. She comes barging up to me and she goes, we know where you're going. You're not going there. And, and I, it just freaked me out. I took out the phone. I opened it up. I said, Stacy, the vice president is here. And she goes, hang on. Don't set down the phone. I'm going to put on Jesse. Jesse gets on. He goes, Tori, I used to run these programs. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Number one is do not set down the phone because they will get you. So don't set down the phone. It takes a while. I have to get to another terminal. I make her carry my luggage. I said, look, I can't stay on the phone and carry my luggage. So she picks up the luggage. So now I have to get on this van to go to another terminal. And I say to the bus driver, I'm trying to escape out of a cult. Can you wow. help me? You know, I'm just trying to get help anyway. And he won't. You know, he's just like, okay, both of you just get on. And right. So she's writing down everything. She follows me everywhere. I, I can't ditch her. You know, mm -hmm. she, she, mm -hmm. I say to Jesse, actually, I, I can't ditch her. She's with me everywhere. And, and Bob gets on the phone, who is a multimillionaire who was helping people get out of Scientology at the time. Never in, but a wonderful man for right. me. And he said, um, and for many other people. And he said, uh, okay, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get your first class ticket. You can go to a special lounge. She can't get in there. And then you can get on the plane. Oh, wow. So he does. I get on first class. I'm sitting there and I think, oh, thank God it's over. Now I can just go get out of Scientology, right? Mm -hmm. Wrong. Mm -hmm. I go to Chicago. I have to change planes. My husband comes walking up in the airport and goes, Tori, what are you doing? We need to go on a vacation. That was exactly what he said. Now, I knew, you have to remember, I was on the dark side of Scientology. So I knew some of the really dark stuff they were doing. I mean, I found out about it as right. I did it. Okay. He knew nothing about it. Nothing. So he was born in Scientology. He was a very kind soul. He, both of us believed in Bill Yachty. Now, I had realized Bill Yachty was a lying, creepy guy. I mean, it, lying to me. You know, he's in the Truman Show, way in the Truman Show. And what was his position there? He's an OT7, or probably eight now. He was on staff at the okay. Enhancement Center, which is now Church of Scientology, Sherman Oak. And he would do OSA in the morning, be the auditor in the afternoon, and see us, which is where they write what you're going to ha have done to you in auditing. And then at night, he would do more of the OSA stuff mm. online and all weekend long. So he was, he was committed wow, to the thing. Yes. He ran the whole volunteer group, which I was a part of. I had told him in session on OT5, which is one of the levels, think of it like a triangle, and it starts out with the communication course all the way up to the top, which is OT8, which is Operating Thetan 8. And I was on Operating Thetan 7. My husband made it to OT8 OT and was a complete wreck after that. See, now I forgot what I was saying. Oh, I no. Said, so he met you in the airport, your yeah, husband. Yeah, he yes. said, we have to go on vacation. Yes. I knew that meant they were going to lock me up in a cabin. And I don't know what they were going to do to me, but I knew that Lisa McPherson did end up getting locked up and killed. And you can look her up on the internet. Yeah. I thought, I'm not going to do this. I said, no. I said, what are you doing here? And he goes, I just happen to be here. Now, why are you, why are you here? <laughs> and so all of a sudden, this big mob of OSA people come up. Oh, God. And I said, I thought you were just here by accident. Right. He said, well, okay, they're with me. And they hand me a big pile of papers. You need to know who you're going with. You know, and I knew it was just a bunch of lies about these people. So I mm -hmm. never read it, but mm -hmm. I took it. And he goes to get on the plane with me. And I said, no. And this is another thing most people don't know that have never been in Scientology. You cannot 
ever call the police. Ever. No matter what? No matter what. You can be getting raped. It doesn't matter. Because? Because it's a high crime. Scientology has the tech to handle it. So not what's happening to you. That's not the high crime. It's if you call the police, that's right. the high that's crime. that's the high crime. Incredible. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so yes. I say to my husband, if you get on this plane, I'm calling the police. If you even try to get on the plane, I'm calling the police. Okay. I said, because my view was this. I felt like I was making, crossing a bridge out of Scientology. I frankly, in July of 2000, wasn't sure, <laughs> Jesse's going to laugh at me, here's this, whether Jesse, Stacy, and Bob, they might really be just fake plants. Do you see what I mean? To right, see no one who's knew. leaving? Of course. We were so paranoid back then. Of course. Nobody knew who to trust. Yeah. So I thought, maybe they're just making this up and they're going to capture me and take me back to Scientology. Oh, God. Right? Right. So I was going to go out, go across there, meet them, find out if they're real or not. If they were real, I was going to come back and get my husband. I didn't know they did all this shit. By the time I got back to him, it was like he was vacuumed out. He was gone. Oh, he was okay. gone. Okay. And he was... They had fed him a bunch of lies about me, and he was positive they were true. And that mm. was it. That was the end of it. Mm. So I fly to Clearwater, and I think, okay, I've been there for seven years doing their top level or second to the top level. I know their bus out to Tampa Airport only goes till midnight. That's it. So I think, okay, I'm fine, because my plane arrives at 1.45 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Wrong. I get off the tarmac or whatever, the walkway thing, and there's a mob of Scientologists, all people that I knew that they had brought out to the airport. They're all screaming. This one lady, Penny Jones, is jumping up and down. Tori, 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 you need to talk to me. And I knew they'd think I was drugged or something if I didn't. So I walk over, and the police are there. It's this mob of Scientologists and Stacy, Bob, and Jesse. Right? Okay. And the police go, stand back. Everyone stand back. And they say, she has to pick which side she's on. So this is a, a monumental moment for me, right? Yes. I mean, I had already decided, but it really brought it into hope. But They're to like, do it in front of them, exactly. I mean, the bravery, right. all of it, yes. And so they go, she has to pick. And so Penny says, Tori, what is going on? What are you doing? Right? Like, I'm totally insane. Right. And I said, you know what? It's a little too much to say in five minutes, Penny. I'm leaving the church. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, she goes, well, and this is the really key thing for me because I had spent seven years on that stupid upper level spending. I, we were $60,000 in debt spending money, oh. money, 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 money all the time. And I was writing David Miscavige saying, this doesn't work. I need off of it. I was 100 pounds overweight at the time. I need to lose weight. You know, I'm worried about my health. My dad died of a heart attack. You know, all this stuff. And I would just get back, okay, continue, okay, continue. So now that I'm escaping out, I moved from nothing, you know, like below the ground nothing as far as attention to, this is what she says to me, I'm good friends with David Miscavige, and I can get a message to David Miscavige tonight from you. And I looked at her, and I looked at the police, and I, I pointed to Bob, Stacy, and Jesse, and I said, I picked them. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So explain that phrase, why that was that tipping point. I can get a message to David Miscavige tonight. Well, here's seven years of me writing and begging to get right. off the level. You knew I, it was... I, I had not only... Right. They were making me try to handle epilepsy with, with their auditing, which it doesn't. My mom kept saying it's a physical condition. It's not a psychosomatic illness. Right. It, you need medication for it. But they were still all the way until OT7 for 30 years trying to get me off that medicine. And I mean, if I were a doctor and I were giving you a pill and it kept making you sicker, I would stop giving it to you. And so if David Miscavige says, okay, uh, thanks for sharing about all the, the trouble you're having, continue, right. right? Here's another pill. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So now to have, and, and wouldn't talk to me, would ever, never meet with me, nothing. And I mean, I'm the top of the top. And all they're doing, they're really abusive. The higher up you get, that's the other thing. People need to know. Because you think they're all like, you just need to get to the next level. No. The next level of every level is less freedom for you. They're cutting off mm. your freedoms because they can't have you talk to these people. Just like me. I talked to Andreas. I'm out of there. That right. was it. All he said was, what kind of friends could those be? Because I wrote him and I said, Andreas, I was crying. I was crying for like four hours. And I said, Andreas, if I leave, I'm going to lose all of my friends and my husband of 27 years. I don't know if my soul can take it. And you know what? This is what I mean by he stuck with me. He said, Tori, I'm, I'm crying reading your email. 
I'm so sorry you're having to go through this, but I have to ask you this one question. What kind of friends could those be if they're going to leave you because you change your mind? Oh, very good so question. So powerful. Very good question. That right. was the cracking of my Truman Show. It's yeah. like sunlight came in. I realized he's right. They're only my friends as long as I jump through their hoop their way. And that's true for every cult. Anybody mm -hmm. in a cult or an abusive relationship, they only love you as long as you do what they say when they say it. The second you're out of it or away mm -hmm. from it, mm -hmm. they're against you. And they start putting you down, making you wrong. You've got to go to ethics or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know, all that crap. And I think also it's true that you're told that, you know, you're going to have a horrible life or something terrible is going to happen to you if you leave it, if you talk about your experiences, if you go for therapy. Oh, my goodness. I have oh, panicked God. clients who come yeah. to my office. But I think one of the best ways to describe how life can be outside is just by living it, just by being like you where you're strong and so capable and happy joyful having friendships real right. friendships and I think for people to just see that you living your yeah. life day to day it's actually a very powerful message and I, I'll say that to anybody I mean it might work a little bit and you might get a little bit of relief but it overall it's just a giant trap with good cheese in the middle of it <laughs> you think, I can hop in, I'll get the cheese. You know, it's like, no, uh -huh. don't do it. Uh -huh. You won't get out. First of all, I know, because I know some of the early guys that ran in the 50s, some of them started leaving when he started Scientology. Mm -hmm. They were Dianeticists. Right, and they exactly. said, uh-uh, we don't want to do this. Right. He didn't want those people to talk to the Dianeticists that left. Uh, so this was his way of declaring, they're declared suppressive. They're evil people. Don't talk to them. Mm -hmm. it, in fact, if you do talk to them, I'm going to declare you suppressive. Oh, wow. Right? Okay. And so that's why I call it the soul-sucking, multi-level, uh, fraudulent business pretending to be a religion. That's Scientology. Okay. That's what it is. Because okay. it does suck out your soul. It rips out your money. It pretends it's a religion when it isn't. And it's multi-level, meaning that if they declare you suppressive now, and this is especially germane to Miscavige. Mm -hmm. Hubbard, I will say, all the time I was there, and remember, I have epilepsy, so I was immediately declared a potential trouble source, meaning you must be connected to someone suppressive if you have any kind of illness. If you're gay, you're PTS. You know, which isn't true. I'm going to say that right away because I know I can talk to people and see them go, oh, that must be true. No, it isn't true. Mm -hmm. It's a hundred percent manipulation and mm -hmm. false mm -hmm. and creepy. But that's what Hubbard said. Mm -hmm. And so from that, you know, he was trying to get people to, you know, he would say that dec declaring someone SP is the last thing that you should use. You should try to use good roads and fair weather where you just talk about movies, history, whatever, but don't talk about Scientology and just try to join, come together on things you can agree with, mm -hmm. which I still think is a good point to this day for parents. Yeah. And, and then secondly... You. Once he died, Miscavige has just now declared, 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 declared. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's it. You're out. Right. And now so many families also who have left have certain parts of their family, certain members who are still in, who then they are disconnected from or that person is disconnected from them and they have to sort of write all these letters and get all this permission and to try to talk to them and or to see them and it just never right. works. Yeah, it never works. No. It's not designed to work at all. They don't, want, they don't want you in communication with anyone that has any knowledge. That's why they have all this internet stuff going on. You see all these people fighting on the internet. I've spent 18 years saying they have three goals to the internet. Mm -hmm. One is distraction off of any hot topic they don't want known. Mm -hmm. Two is degrading any activists that they don't want listened to. Mm -hmm. And three is to just slime the area so that people go, I don't even want to post there anymore. Right. Okay. Okay. So it's an easy way to, you know, if you see that happening, I say just start posting facts again instead of arguing with a person about the person. I don't like uh, Joe. Who cares? Right. Nobody cares. You know what I mean? They care because they're like, great. I've been with Yachty when he'll go like this. Bingo. Let's go. Uh -huh. And I go, let's go what? This was in 2000. I'm like, mm -hmm. let's go what? what? What are you talking about? And he's like, well, I've had my 10, because he opened up 10 phony identities with the accounts I opened. And he would use those to distract or degrade people. I didn't know that, but that's what was happening. Mm. So now he goes, bingo, let's go. And I go, let's go what? And he goes, ah, oh, these guys are going to be ar ar arguing together amongst themselves 
for days, weeks, months. But what he was happy about was that a real critic or a real ex-Scientologist finally started taking on whatever distraction he was trying uh, to use. Uh -huh. They were now arguing about that. Right. And he was like, perfect. Yeah. They're going to be arguing forever. <sighs> and they're totally off Scientology. They're not talking about Hubbard. They're not talking about Miscavige. This is perfect. They're, they're arguing about golf. <laughs> you know, or, or that person, you Whatever. know, I don't like her. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, perfect. Let them argue. They'll argue forever. Yeah. And we'd go to dinner. He'd say, let's go to dinner. We don't have to worry about it. They're going to be arguing forever. <laughs> they knew exactly what they were doing. And I've tried to tell people this over and over. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and what's the solution? Just keep posting facts. Right. That's the only, he said, the only thing I can't handle is if somebody doesn't answer one of my, you know, if they don't answer. Hmm. Okay. Or if they post facts about, if they repost right. facts they don't want to know. So I know we have to, to finish up, but what I wanted to tell you was that, you know, there's so many contradictions within the group, which you can see once you leave it, and you can see a little bit while you're there, but you're not supposed to <laughs> notice it, uh, or think there's something wrong with you for noticing it. That's okay. Um, but I think also knowing that you had these this training routine where you're supposed to not react to the bull baiting, I know that there is this whole idea where, you know, the sort of the worst thing is the reactive mind. What I have noticed is that at least this, the Scientologists who I know have harassed them worse are so highly reactive. I've never met a more reactive group of people. Right. And so if, if there are Scientologists out there who want to harass me or harass or harass anyone, they're sort of proving that Scientology is not working. Right. And so I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah. Right? And, they, and their Scientology network, I just remembered what it was, Human Rights. That was their first show, is on Human Rights. Oh, and I said, that's right. First of all, they don't believe in humans. No. They're called Thetans. Yeah. Right? They're spirits. So right. anybody that's a human is a wog, and they're a degraded being. Yeah. So they they're talking about human rights. They don't they all they do is stop human rights, any kind of freedoms, freedom to speak. Yeah. Walk up to any Scientologist. Now for people they don't know, they'll be very nice, very kind, that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. no. And here's the thing I always say, mm -hmm. you don't have to believe me. All you have to do is go on the internet and look at both sides. Read their side mm -hmm. and read other people's sides mm -hmm. and make up your own mind for real. And I always ask people this, <clears throat> because it's really checkmate if you were playing a chess game. It's like we, and I mean every critic, every ex-Scientologist, every anonymous person that's taken on the Church of Scientology, anybody, all the never-ins, everybody, we can say, look at both sides, make up your own mind. The media can do the same. Mm -hmm. Everybody. We can all, we're all on the side of truth. They can never say, look at both sides. They have to say, don't talk to Tori. He's really awful. Mm -hmm. Right, and she's this and she's that. She had an affair. I spent 10 years walking up to their staff saying, If I had an affair, who'd I have an affair with? I'd like to meet them. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and finally, the YouTube people said, Hey, guess what? They took it off your hate page. <laughs> uh -huh. Right. But just knowing how, what a respectful stance that is, that you're giving people the benefit of being able to make a fully educated decision. Yeah, make your own mind. Because right. I don't, you know, it doesn't matter to me. Right. I know, we all know, if people really honestly look at both sides, they will never walk into the Church of Scientology to become a member. Never. Wow. Not ever. One more thing before you go. When people are being manipulated by others, they're also often being financially manipulated, like in Scientology. We all know about televangelists who ask people to give them their last pennies as a show of faith to offer up more to God so that they receive more in return. Some snake oil salesmen and women tell you that if you do not have the cash, you need to open up new lines of credit because the more you spend on their services and the cure they're trying to sell you, the better you will be, and then the more able you'll be to make that money back tenfold. Some people will convince you that money is evil at the root of all of your bad luck or illness, so you need to give it over to them to purify it and to purify you. Multi-level marketing systems and large group awareness trainings will get your money up front, then tell you you need to stay with this and keep pouring more money into the organization, borrowing it if you have to. Some groups even tell you that their services and courses are free. 
but they're actually keeping tabs on you and an actual tab. And they'll tell you that you need to pay up as soon as you say you're leaving. And usually the amount that you owe is much more than you can ever afford to pay. So you feel stuck and you stay. I had a client who came in once who told me that I was actually wrong about her group. I guess there had been an article where I had said something about how people have to spend so much money and that that's not disclosed up front. Somehow she said that I had made an assumption that so much money was a part of this group and I was really, really wrong. She told me that she did not have to pay a penny for any of it. I knew that she did not have any money and had used up her savings, and that's why she had asked to see me for a very reduced rate, and in fact, sometimes for free. So I asked why she had no money now, if in her last few years in the group, she said she hadn't paid a penny, and she said, no, no, that's not what she meant. It's not that she didn't spend any money while she was in the organization. In fact, she had spent thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, in fact. So... I asked how that happened, that she spent tens of thousands of dollars, but somehow it was still free. And she said, oh, well, we took care of each other in this group. That's what it was all about. I didn't pay for myself. That would have been selfish. My courses were free for me. But out of my own free will and my generosity, I helped to make it possible for other people to go by helping pay their way. It wasn't a fee. It was a donation I made on behalf of others. That's how we did it. Meaning, that's how people paid. They paid for each other, but still, a fee was paid. She did not see that all that had happened was that the language had been shifted so that it wasn't that she was paying, but rather donating or making it possible for other people to go. It's a lot of word salad, and at the end of the day, you have no cash. And what's also interesting is that when people give their money over with the promise of making that money back and then some, but then find over time that this is not happening, they're not having financial success. It's actually built into the system that they're to see this as their fault, that they didn't do things perfectly. They didn't follow the teachings perfectly. They didn't follow the leader perfectly. They did not believe it in their hearts when they were going over the teachings. They had feelings or thoughts of doubt while they were leading their courses or taking their courses. Whatever the reason, it's on them. And the people who made that promise can walk away without having to make good on it, ever. It's also very important to know that some of the organizations that we're talking about on this podcast use the money that people spend to pay for teams of attorneys who will then be used against you if you file a complaint, if you want to get your money back, if you want to speak out against the group or about any of your negative experiences there. You are paying the salaries of the people who will be making your life miserable and keeping you from having any recourse or justice. Sometimes groups, and I know this happens in Scientology, I've heard it many times, will suddenly need you to take a class over again and pay for it all over again because they say there was a typo in the book or they changed some of the teachings so it's no longer perfect and it's no longer helpful and it's no longer authorized and it doesn't count and it can't be used as a step towards a higher level. And then you find out that they were trying to make more money to buy a new building or to make more money so they could pay off their legal bills. Someone I know who got caught up with a psychic could always tell in the later years right before she left this relationship that there was an event coming up in the psychic's life like the psychic's daughter was getting married or they were trying to buy a new office space to do psychic readings because just before this she would be warned that she had something terribly wrong with her that she needed to pay the psychic more money for in order to be healed from and to prevent from happening. Many organizations also have tax-exempt status, and we know who they are. They keep all the money you give them, usually under great pressure, duress, and hardship on your part. So what is always true, though, is that the leader, the person in charge of any of these organizations, is the one who is living large off of everyone's donations. But it's never seen that way and never described that way. He or she is somehow being rewarded by God or deserves this all because of the sacrifices they're making to devote their life and all of their energy to saving you. So Rajneesh can have his fleet of 44 Rolls Royces while followers sleep on the floor. And somehow within that organization, it's explained away and it somehow makes sense. But when you have the distance, the perspective, you get to see that all of the reasons given were just excuses for the leader to line his pockets, for the leader to fulfill her narcissistic need, for the leader to not give up his riches or toys or gifts 
so be careful. If someone says something is free, but somehow you seem to be broke because of it. If somehow someone tells you that you will have prosperity if you give over your money, know that this does not make sense. It's a mathematical equation where A plus B equals poverty and eventual resentment. Remember that if somebody says you need to give them money or you need to spend money on what they're providing in order to be safe, in order to have all the answers, in order to be part of the most important group of people, in order to receive the gifts that you can only get there, and in order to be loved by God, hold onto your wallet and walk out the door. Talk to you next week. Indoctrination is available for download on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, and more. Please support Indoctrination at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Subscribers receive bonus episodes, interviews, and other cool goodies. Send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. Thank you for your support.